Welcome back again to another episode of Big Red's Isopods. And this week we're going to be taking a look at one of the most popular isopods in the hobby uh, for any sort of bioactive setup. Trichorema tomentosa, the dwarf white isopod. So before further ado, let's get into it. All right, everyone, so here we have one of my many cultures of dwarf whites. As you can see, there is quite a few dwarf whites in here. They do breed like crazy. Obviously, dwarf whites are known throughout the hobby as one of the more, the most, or the more popular isopod to use whenever you're using a bioactive setup, due to the fact that they are gonna breed in uh, enormous numbers. Actually, a lot of the isopods you'll see will actually be in the soil. If I were to dig down, you would see a lot of different isopods in the soil and whatnot. They are literally everywhere in the soil. You know that your culture uh, has a lot of dwarf whites when you're starting to see them on top of the soil because 90% of the time dwarf whites stay underneath the, the dirt. Dwarf whites are great to have if you want to have a bioactive setup. Now, as a hobbyist, I don't think they're really a necessary isopod to have due to the fact that the only thing that you're going to have with them is that they're going to potentially be a hazard to other cultures. Now that I've touched the soil in here, I could potentially have small isopods on me, and they're really hard to notice due to the fact that dwarf whites will always play dead whenever they're disturbed. As you can see, these guys here, they're just moving around. But if I were to actually tap here, they're going to play dead and they will actually stay still for quite some time. Not always, but most of the time they will play dead for quite some time. As you can see, he's just sitting still there. And then once he notices there's no more movement, he's going to move around. They are really tiny, so they are very delicate. So there is a hazard to squish the isopods. Uh, another thing that you want to remember when you have these isopods is they're not going to be really, they're not going to disappear. If you have any sort of frog or reptile of any sort, any lizard or even a tortoise, they're not going to these aren't going to be eaten up by those animals. The only animal that you could get that would eat these would be dart frogs, small dart frogs. And I really don't think there's any way that they're going to eat enough of these for you to lose your entire culture. Just because they stay underground, they stay hidden, and like I said, when they're disturbed, they will completely sit still, which isn't really going to be an eye catch for your frogs. If you have dart frogs, they do like to hunt during the day so that means they rely on movement for them to see their prey they don't rely on smell or any other senses like a lot of other nocturnal animals do uh, some nocturnal animals have good vision like my frogs do but i definitely don't think you're gonna have to worry about these being eaten if you have any any sort of bioactive setup they're gonna stay hidden well underneath the ground they're gonna breed like crazy they won't eat away everything that you have in there. They are very voracious. They will eat pretty much anything, but I find their appetite isn't as big as some of the larger isopods, obviously because of their size, but also due to other things. When I feed these guys, I actually, here I'll show you right here. I just put a little bit of fish food in here along the soil because they can't actually climb very well. There was a couple up here on the bark, as you can see, but that's because there's a lot of isopods in here. The majority of them are in the soil, and that's where the ones that are feeding are gonna be. These guys up here on the bark aren't gonna eat enough for me to even wanna sprinkle some on here. They can crawl off into the soil and find some of the fish food that way. A lot of other isopods, I do like to feed protein and vegetables to them, but usually once a week, I only give them one or the other. I will spray down this container quite a bit, with the mister to make sure that it has quite a moist area. Dwarf whites are a tropical species, so they do prefer a high moisture gradient compared to other ones. Uh, ventilation, minimal. Uh, I do have one hole on either side on here 
and there is a hole in the lid, but I actually leave this one at the bottom of a stack of multiple others. So that hole actually doesn't really do anything. It was just something I did when I first got all my bins, I just put holes in the top of all the lids. That's why you'll see in a lot of my videos, pretty much all of them are made the same. But one thing I will say about dwarf whites that it is a negative is that when they get into any other culture, I'll show you my powder blues still in a, how they still are in a second here, but they will outcompete any other culture that you put them up against, except for one that I've noticed, and that is the Florida Fast. The Florida Fast are the only ones, I think it's because they're about the same size, but they have a better appetite and they are more quick. So they're quicker to get the food and then they're quicker to take back off. So they'll get it way before the dwarf whites will. And those are the only ones that I've seen out compete dwarf whites. Other than that, they'll completely take over a culture and we'll take a look at that now. So this here, oh, one sec here, is one of my cultures of powder blues. So as you can see here in the soil, here, let me get a focus here. There's dwarf whites in the soil. Those aren't baby isopods. I know baby isopods or monkai look very similar, but these are a lot of dwarf whites that are in the soil here with the powder blues. Now the number of dwarf whites highly exceeds the number of powder blues. I don't know if I'd be lucky enough. Oh, there's, there's a smaller juvenile powder blue. So you can see what they look like. They are having babies in here, which is a better sign. I've been kind of getting rid of the the dwarf whites a little bit, or maybe it's because I'm overfeeding. I'm not too sure, but the powder blue are starting to come back. I don't know if it's because I'm keeping them the way I'm keeping them or what, but I'll let you know when I finally get rid of all the dwarf whites. But as you can clearly see, even just moving a little piece of soil, they're just everywhere under here, just everywhere. The soil is just loaded with them. And that's what causes any of the isopods to not thrive because their monkai can't eat due to the fact that the dwarf whites are the same size and eat the same thing as the monkai and they'll just outcompete anything else. I've said this a lot in my other videos and I'll just continue to repeat it. Anytime I talk about dwarf whites, you need to be careful with them. You need to wash your hands after touching any of their containers, including this one here. I'm going to wash my hands again. I washed them before, but I'm going to wash them again. And you have to make sure that they're not gonna get infested in any container because you will lose numbers. I'm just lucky these uh, powder blues held on because they are one of the higher breeding species out there. But if I had got dwarf whites in any of my other cultures that are slower breeders, like my Cubaris or my some of my Spanish species, they would have been done for. Even some of the Armadillidium wouldn't hold up against these guys. So you need to be, be care you need to take care whenever you're handling dwarf white bins. I always keep mine here. I'll show you here. I always keep my dwarf whites at the bottom of my shelf here. As you can see, I have lots of isopods up on top, but the dwarf whites are kept at the bottom. And that's so that they can't fall down out of that bin. If they escape, they can't get into another bin because it's that dangerous. Some of these isopods do cost a lot of money to, when I start up the cultures, and I don't really want them to be outcompeted by these guys. So I try my best to keep them away. Other than that, guys, dwarf whites are definitely one of the easiest species to keep. If you have them in a bioactive setup, you gotta, it re, it's going to require no maintenance whatsoever. You might have to get rid of some of the extra bits that are missed by the cleanup crew yourself or get another species of isopod to put in there after a while to kind of help with it. Uh, one of the prunatus or lavis to take care of the bigger bits while these guys take care of the soil. That's what I would highly suggest. You're not going to have as much numbers with the other ones, but they're mostly going to get eaten by your animal anyway. I would definitely recommend these guys, and they are a great food supplement if you have any dart frogs as well. All right, guys, so the outro I tried to record didn't record properly, and I couldn't upload it to my laptop. Anyway, <laughs> dwarf whites are a great isopod if you want to have some sort of bioactive cleanup. They'll clean up almost everything in your containers. But the downside to having them is if you have any other cultures or of any isopods or any other sort of invertebrates or whatnot, they will outcompete and eat a lot of the food. So unless you have something that's eating larger food that the dwarf whites can't really bother, then it's kind of an issue. But if you got just a reptile or an amphibian, they're great to have. And if you want to use them as a feeder for dart frogs, they're great as well. 
Anyway, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you guys all again next week.